Oh, hi. Thank you and welcome everybody. It's a hard day today outside, so I'm happy to be here next to the air conditioner. And we are happy to welcome David Fraser today. David is one of Canada's top leading privacy and cyber law practitioners. And David works with a variety of clients from startups to billion dollar companies, public sector organizations in risk management and incident response. David will share his presentation today with us and David will speak about the title of his presentation is playing nicely with lawyers to provide more value in your engagements. And in his presentation, David will discuss the topics of legal privilege, how it works, and how you can collaborate with legal counsel to provide this protection to your client. Now, that specific presentation was, if I'm not mistaken, the keynote presentation in the recent Cybersecurity Summit. And I only heard great responses about it. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to join, so I'm happy to be given the chance to hear it now. And on kind of like a personal note, based on my own personal experience coming out from the Canada Revenue Investigative Division, SCP issues are very much alive and very much relevant. And I'm sure that knowing how to properly deal and address with them may affect the results of the case. So thank you, David. Thank you so much. And please take it away. Uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for the for the kind invitation, uh, I've I've had the pleasure of presenting a number of number of times at the uh, at the national conference, and it's always uh, certainly when it's in person, it's always a, a great opportunity to meet and also to learn uh, from some very very skilled people. And so the title talks about playing nicely with lawyers, and I'm I'm going to assume, or I guess more, I'm going to hope. Uh, that when you cross paths with lawyers, you're going to, or working with lawyers, you're going to be working with lawyers who are going to pl play nicely with you. Um, but the, the, the purpose of this presentation and this discussion, and I hope to leave uh, ample time at the end for some question or discussion, is simply to un help understand what lawyers are doing when they're involved, particularly after an incident and dealing with incident response and why lawyers are doing what it is that they're doing and what it is that they're hoping to accomplish. And often uh, in-house lawyers, for example, with a company that's dealing with the, with the incident response, that lawyer may be the person calling the shots. And so understanding why they're doing that, what their concerns are, what they're trying to manage, I think helps everybody work together as, uh, as a team in order to accomplish the, the objectives of that, uh, of that particular thing. And certainly there are other circumstances in which lawyers and uh, information security professionals and investigators are, are working together. Uh, certainly there have been a number of times when I've had to retain experts to do forensic examination of devices and, and things like that. Similar concepts are, are going to come into play, but mainly what I'm going to be talking about is in the incident response sort of, uh, sort of space, which is, I expect, something that all of you or many of you are, are seeing a lot of. And lawyers who, who work in this area, and it's a growing group of, of lawyers, there's been an explosion in privacy-related litigation, so an explosion in privacy-related legal risk. Uh, and uh, so lawyers are often brought in uh, into many circumstances in which uh, information security professionals are also brought in. And we're largely seeing what I think you're seeing. And all of these on this slide employees snooping through customer information, through patient information, employees in banks looking at customer records, employees at hospitals looking at patient records without any, any reason um, is a, a significant uh, source of, of data breaches. Email inbox intrusions uh, seems to be a dime a dozen these days. Um, significant numbers of organizations have been affected by this for a number of different reasons. Introduces legal risk and, and requires a legal response. Funds diversions, I've seen a growing number of these with respect to often coupled with an email inbox intrusion, bad guy hovering around waiting to uh, change uh, uh, banking information related to a transaction to instead of the $100,000 at the closing of a transaction going to the vendor, it goes to somebody else's, uh, somebody else's account. Ransomware, of course, ransomware now plus 
a greater emphasis on exfiltration as organizations are are getting better at locking down their uh, their backups and securing their backups offline and and becoming more resilient to the ransomware threat. While the ransomware actors are are of course upping their game, uh, they're very very creative. At that the exfiltration is often a form of data theft, which is sometimes on its own, and then economic espionage. Um, and uh, seen reports even in the last little while where a growing number of lawyers and law firms are targets uh, for this sort of thing, where uh, hackers, I understand, principally uh, located in India, hiring themselves out, contacting private investigators, saying they can perform, do cyber work in connection with litigation uh, and go after law firm uh, systems in order to uh, penetrate into information that's otherwise privileged and that should be, should be secured. So lawyers are brought into all sorts of scenarios and probably for many people on this call, you're involved in scenarios like this and, and responding and, and your path will cross, has, has crossed uh, with lawyers or, or will in the future. And so I need, for, for, for my point of view, as a lawyer who practices in this area, I need to understand at least enough about the technical side uh, I can't say that I'm a, 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 by any means a technical expert when it comes to the sorts of forensic work and, and incident response that needs to take place. Uh, but I like to think that I understand enough about what can be done and, and what the professionals are doing uh, so that I'm not in their way and so that I can work collaboratively with them together. And, uh, and I hope the, uh, after this, there'll be a, a better understanding or a fuller understanding of, of the reverse side of that. And so every time a lawyer steps into an incident, we see just a blizzard of legal issues and legal risks. Um, it depends upon the scenario, depends upon exactly what's going on, but we're concerned about litigation, we're concerned about losses, we're concerned about uh, impact on the business, business continuity, we're concerned about possible lawsuits by business partners and collaborators, we're concerned about so many different things um, and are just, hopefully not stunned when we walk in there, but we're going through in our head, thinking about what are all the different things that are, that are going on here? What are all the different things that are going wrong? Um, not only is there the, the, the risk of litigation, increasingly there's a risk of investigation and the federal uh, government just tabled uh, a replacement for the federal privacy law, PIPEDA, in parliament uh, just at the end of June, which is going to bring in when it's passed significant penalties uh, that did not exist before. So the legal risk, in fact, has gone up even more uh, than it ex or, or will be going up uh, whenever that legislation is passed and, uh, and comes, into, comes into force. But although we're looking at it from the point of view and through an absolutely legal lens, uh, there has to be a recognition that, of course, there's, there needs to be a multidisciplinary response and a multidisciplinary approach to dealing with an incident. Uh, because they don't only call for a technical response. Obviously, probably priority number one is to, if there's an ongoing breach, is to stop it uh, and to, as best you can, secure the system uh, and get it back up and running if you can. Uh, and those are absolutely technical. Those require expertise well beyond my capabilities and require people who understand the systems, people who understand information security, understand vulnerabilities, understand the, the trade craft of the bad guys or the threat actors, all those other sorts of things. But happening simultaneously, uh, there are a whole bunch of stakeholders who have an interest and not just that they're interested in what is going on because you know, the, the universe of people who are interested in what is going on just out of curiosity is, is almost infinite. But there are people who actually have a vested interest in, in what's happening. And a, a, an organization with a mature privacy and information security posture, at least from a, a legal risk management point of view, uh, is going to have a multidisciplinary team who need to be involved in incident response. Obviously, it's going to be senior management. We're talking about in, in the immediate response to an incident and even in the long term response to it significant decisions have to be made that some of them involve significant outlays of money, uh, involve questions about where was management, why, was, why did the vulnerability exist that might have been exploited. Uh, there could be personnel issues going on at the, at the same time. So senior management ultimately need to be the ones who, who make the call. And when it comes to certain legal regimes, uh, senior management is where, is where the buck stops, is where the decisions actually have to be made for these sorts of, sorts of issues. Then we have risk managers and insurance people. 
Uh, risk managers spend all their time thinking about risk, how to manage risk, uh, but also how to insure risk. And then there's going to be the insurance folks uh, who are need to be there and need to be brought into the loop as quickly as possible. Um, that insurance policies, to the extent that they insure cybersecurity incidents, uh, the insurance policy requires notifying the insurer at the earliest possible opportunity about the incident. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a bit. So that, so that notification, that needs to be among the first calls. Uh, and the people who are familiar with what insurance exists uh, need to be around the table, at least for the initial uh, overview of what's going on. You're going to have communication staff. Uh, who are concerned about public relations, who are concerned about investor relations if it's a public, uh, a public company. They're going to, uh, in some in incidents, require, for example, taking systems offline, which becomes noticeable or, and public. Uh, and you need to be prepared for queries from customers, from stakeholders, from the media about what's going on. And you need to have messaging that's, uh, that's prepared in order to do that. Marketing people are going to be concerned about what impact this is going to have on customers. Uh, and customer retention and customer attraction. Then there's lawyers uh, and then also God forbid politicians. So if it's a public sector entity that has an incident, uh, we've had significant ransomware attacks on municipalities, for example. There was a significant, very high profile incident involving uh, health information in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador that uh, had politicians being called out and, uh, and uh, health ministers and others being asked questions by the media. Uh, and so there's politics at play in certain things. And so all of these people have particular roles. They, many of them and each of them will probably say that their priority is the highest one. Um, but you know, thinking of it in terms of a team and, and for those who have been through this, uh, each one of them has an important role to play. Uh, and some, some of those roles are more important at different times depending upon how the incident is, uh, is playing out. Um, but when you're part of one of these teams, the more you understand about all these different people, why they're there, what they're interested in, what information they need in order to do their important jobs, the more of that that you know, the, the better you'll be able to be on that team and working with the rest of the people in the team. Because very often, uh, this uh, I expect this is probably the experience of the technical folks on the on the call. Every single one of those people are looking to you for information about what happened, information about what's being done. Uh, very often, you're taking instructions from all of these people, um, and they're telling you what to do. So the more that you understand what it is that they need, I think the more indispensable ultimately you're going to be for the team. Um, and you know, ultimately what the team needs is gonna be, is gonna be shifting depending upon the type of the incident and depending upon what the, what the overall risk posture is, uh, what the, if, if the number one concern is litigation rather than regulatory, that's gonna have a slightly different character. Some people are gonna be more important than, than others. Um, certainly it's my experience that in a significant incident, you wanna have all of these people around the table. And if there's anyone who's not needed, then you can let them go or, or kind of keep them on standby or keep them on call. Uh, in the event that you need them, need them later. Now, one of the things that, that's important is that within this multidisciplinary team, very often it's the lawyer who's taking the lead. And that's for a number of reasons. And because for, you know, I think probably the role of lawyers is overblown in a lot of organizations. And in a lot of scenarios, not everything is necessarily a legal issue, uh, but it, certainly a cybersecurity issue uh, is a legal issue and raises significant legal issues. But I think one of the reasons why lawyers are um, taking the lead is for the purpose of legal privilege. And I'm going to talk about that at, at some length, about what that means, what that involves, and, and how, uh, how it comes into being and how it can be, uh, unfortunately, uh, vaporized. Uh, in, in the blink of an eye. But so why are lawyers taking the lead? Well, lawyers are thinking about uh, not just kind of what's going on and who's going to sue who, but they're advising the clients on meeting their legal obligations for reporting and notification. So we have had in Alberta for quite some time an obligation to notify the privacy commissioner and notify affected individuals in the event of a breach of security safeguards that causes a real risk of significant harm. Our federal privacy law was, was um, updated, amended with the Digital Privacy Act a number of years ago to provide the same thing. Quebec's law is doing the same. 
the replacement for pipeta is going to do that even more with with greater consequences if there's non-compliance with these obligations so lawyers are, are there to tell them what really what it is that you have to do in some cases it's even what law applies um because it, it, if you're an organization in Ontario and you have information related to a resident of British Columbia, there's a good chance that the Personal Information Protection Act of British Columbia is going to apply to that data related to that particular individual, even though most of the organization's obligations are going to be under the federal law. So pulling apart those, those threads and figuring out kind of what are the legal obligations with respect to what's going on. Um, and how do we fulfill those obligations? Also, how do we collect the information that's going to be necessary in order to provide that reporting and notification? The lawyers are also preparing to defend any lawsuits that follow. Most significant uh, security incidents that involve personal information result in litigation in class actions. Uh, and we've seen an explosion of those in the last uh, in the last ten years. So it's pretty foreseeable in the event of a large scale data breach, depending upon the nature of the information that's been compromised or accessed, that there will be, or it's likely that there will be litigation. And so lawyers are there to do their best to prepare, get all of the ducks in a row that they can at that particular stage to anticipate that litigation and be as prepared for it as possible. We also see a large number of regulatory investigations, principally by privacy commissioners in the aftermath of a significant data breach, but there may also be other regulators who have an interest. If it's a financial institution, uh, the financial watchdogs may be interested. If it's, a, um, if it's an organization like a, uh, a broker, a stock broker, there could be uh, securities regulators who are gonna be involved. If it's a public company, there may be securities regulators involved with respect to uh, the, the disclosures that the company makes uh, with respect to its security uh, posture and with respect to what, to, to what went on. And then, of course, once you understand those risks, the lawyer is going to be providing advice on what are the steps that you should be taking in order to manage those risks, in order to mitigate those risks. Are there things that you can do uh, in order to prevent things from, going, from getting worse? And in fact, there are steps that a lawyer would often suggest to make it better right out of the gate. And that's what lawyers are, are doing. Now, lawyers can't do this in a vacuum. Lawyers have to be on the, on the team. And lawyers rely on security pros to provide them with much of the information necessary to do all of the above. The, the report to a privacy commissioner is gonna to wanna to know what happened. What was the vulnerability? How long has that been in, in case? What's the information that was involved? How long did they have access to it? Did they exfiltrate it? All those sorts of things, there's, there's very little that, that a lawyer can do to compile that information without the assistance of, of competent uh, people with expertise who know who are able to investigate the incident, understand the, si the systems involved, understand what went on and provide them with that, with that information. And there's also questions that, that you think kind of normal people questions are gonna be legal questions. Uh, what's the standard of care for safeguarding this data? So negligence, a, a lawsuit in negligence will be successful or should be successful if there was a duty of care that the organization had with respect to somebody, in this case, let's say the, the individuals, the customers whose information was compromised. So was there a duty of care to take to protect it? Yes, yes, there, there would be in most cases. Was there a standard of care? So what would be the reasonable thing to do? What are the reasonable steps that should be taken by a prudent organization who is the custodian of information like this? What are the steps that they should be taking in order to safeguard that data? Recognizing that there's, there's not an expectation of perfection, at least in law, there might be an expectation of perfection among some people, um, but what was the standard? What, what do people patch their systems on day one or do they wait a week and to find out or do they, just use one example. Is it, did the organization implement, let's say, encryption uh, of the data at rest uh, because are others in that field doing it? What information security standards have they adopted and is that standard for that industry? And so InfoSec professionals will understand that and say, well, this is, this is what is the standard practice and that becomes the standard of care and a significant legal liability can turn on what is that standard of care? And did the organization live up to it? What measures did they take to protect that data? And were those, were those measures reasonable and appropriate and proportionate uh, in the circumstances? Were they adequate given the sensitivity of the, of the data? So our, our privacy legislation requires that information be safeguarded with measures uh, that are appropriate to the sensitivity of the data. Is it just a phone list? 
uh, or is it banking information or medical information? The stakes are much higher, the more sensitive the information. So the, uh, the, the measures to be taken are proportionately higher in terms of the, the obligations to safeguard that data. Could the risk have been foreseen? So in some instances, you have a, an incident uh, that was caused by an unknown zero day um, that was not known, that you might not have been able to prudently protect against. Um, and so, you know, frankly, if, if the organization did everything that they could and was reasonable in the circumstances, but a bad guy got in by exploiting an, an unknown, a previously unknown exploit, um, the organization can actually have zero liability because they could not have foreseen that this in fact was going to happen. Did they, should they have known, for example, that two-factor authentication will significantly uh, increase the, the uh, safeguards and securities of, a, of an email system? Absolutely, they should have known that. Did they know that? Uh, did they have a robust and mature security posture? Were there gaps? Did the, did the people involved actually understand what they were doing? Has it ever been subject to external review, a risk analysis, a gap analysis? Worst cases was the client reckless. They knew that they had vulnerabilities and they did nothing about it. That, uh, that goes from negligence uh, to gross negligence. And that could be significant. Did they put their client at undue risk through their recklessness? Um, and you know, did they consistently treat the information as being confidential or, or protected? Were they careless in one area, but prudent in another, even though uh, let's say the bad guy got into the area where they were robustly secured, the fact that there were other areas with significant vulnerabilities that they had, had left to languish uh, can have a significant negative impact on, on the organization's liability. But again, all of that is, is information that lawyers will analyze, will hope to have somebody compile for them, feed into them so that they can provide that, that advice. And so everybody at the table has particular skills, um, but lawyers have a particular set of skills and also a bit of, uh, I guess, kind of secret sauce that they have. Because what lawyers bring to the table is also uh, hopefully value, <laughs> uh, hopefully good advice, um, but it's also privilege. And lawyers bring privilege to, uh, to a situation in many cases. But privilege is a little bit fragile and privilege is also not necessarily that well understood. And privilege is being tested so many of you may be familiar with a, uh, an investigation or an incident involving a company called Life Labs. And a number of, uh, there was a, a significant incident. They hired a number of uh, really good, well-known organizations to do uh, an investigation of what happened within this particular incident. And the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, I think also of British Columbia, I think also of Alberta. Uh, so there were multiple commissioners that were involved. They simultaneously, they did a, a joint investigation, uh, went looking for and demanded, in fact, uh, the reports that those consultants had produced. And the uh, Life Labs said that these reports are privileged, subject to solicitor client privilege, and they would not be provided. And then uh, the Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, who, who does have the ability to issue orders, uh, issued an order requiring Life Labs to hand over uh, correspondence between Life Labs and or its external counsel. So it had outside lawyers who were involved and the following third parties retained by Life Labs, CrowdStrike, Cytelligence, Optive, Deloitte and KPMG. And so they're looking for uh, the, the, the report created by CrowdStrike, uh, any drafts of it, uh, a document created by Cytelligence and, and a penetration test and ordered it to be produced uh, by the 20th of April, 2020, or 29th of April, 2020. Uh, so the organization decided, they, they asserted that it was privileged and they asserted that they were not going to provide it to the privacy commissioner and did not have to provide it. Uh, and so actually commenced, sought a court order in Ontario looking to block, uh, essentially to overturn the order from the commissioner requiring them to hand over this information on the basis that it was, that it was privileged. Um, and I did a look today, we, we haven't seen and I haven't heard of a decision coming out of this particular case. Um, certainly two years is a long time uh, for something like this to be 
uh, sitting there. And uh, but you know the, the the pandemic has caused some complications and slowdowns in the in the court, and a whole bunch of really important things like murder cases are, are backed up. So this might be taking a little bit of a backseat, but, but kind of keep your ear to the ground looking for the, the outcome of this because um, many organizations like Life Labs are going to look to have as much of this information protected by privilege uh, as they can for a, number of, for a number of reasons. And now I've probably said the word privilege dozens of times already in this, in this presentation, but let's talk a little bit about really what that is. So there are two kinds of privilege that come into play uh, in these sorts of circumstances. You know, there are other kinds of privilege. There's a priest penitent privilege, much less absolute than solicitor client, but uh, uh, unless uh, you're getting uh, spiritual advice in connection with the data breach, that's probably not gonna come into play. Um, maybe the bad guy is gonna make a confession to his priest, but again, that's, that's not uh, what we're talking about here. Um, but we're talking about the two main kinds of legal privileges that exist. The first one is legal advice privilege, sometimes called solicitor client privilege, uh, sometimes called attorney client privilege. Um, and so that's a form of privilege that arises where the communication record, work product, et cetera, is created for the purpose of obtaining legal advice from a lawyer. Doesn't say it has to be created by a lawyer. Doesn't say it has to be created for the lawyer. It says it's created for the purpose of obtaining legal advice from a lawyer. So a lawyer has to be involved for legal advice privilege. A qualified lawyer in the jurisdiction uh, has, to be, uh, has to be there. So for example, if there's a retired lawyer who's no longer a member of the bar of any particular province, their advice is not going to be privileged. Uh, they, they, they cannot provide legal advice and solicitor client privilege or legal advice privilege only relates to the actual provision of, of legal advice. There's a second category called litigation privilege. And this is where the communication record, work product, et cetera, is created for the purpose of preparing for actually anticipated litigation. And so this can be information gathering by a private investigator uh, in order to help defend a legal claim. This can be records that are created without a lawyer being specifically and directly involved, as long as it's about pre uh, uh, preparing for a lawsuit that is actually pending or is actually anticipated. And this privilege actually disappears after the litigation. So the purpose of, of, of these two privileges, you can think of them, they're obviously quite complementary. Um, the legal advice privilege creates a zone of privacy um, that's almost impenetrable so that organizations or individuals are able to confidently get legal advice to understand their legal position. And it's a quasi-constitutional right uh, that, that individuals and organizations have. And it's because from a public policy point of view, our legal system says it is absolutely critical that members of our society should be able to get advice from qualified lawyers in order to understand their legal position. And a significant and important part of that is that uh, the clients need to be absolutely honest uh, or there shouldn't be any structural impediments for that honesty. And so they need to know that whatever they tell their lawyer and what their lawyer tells them will never come to anybody else's knowledge or attention unless the client, because it's the client's privilege, not the lawyer's privilege, unless the client decides to waive that privilege. So it creates that zone of privacy and that zone of privacy uh, exists forever until the client or if the client decides to waive it. Uh, and if the, the and it kind of it goes to the grave and a lawyer is not permitted, according to the rules of professional conduct, to provide information uh, that would be privileged. And most courts are not able to obtain information uh, that would be privileged, that is properly subject to privilege. So it has to fit within this, within the, this definition. Litigation privilege is a zone of privacy to allow an organization to prepare for litigation, prepare and manage and defend themselves or prosecute a particular piece of piece of litigation. There, in connection with most lawsuits, there is an obligation on the part of both sides 
to provide to the other side all the relevant records uh, that could exist that are relevant and factual or, or relevant to any of the facts that are in dispute in the litigation. And so without this litigation privilege, theoretically, everything that's produced in order to help defend the lawsuit would need to be provided on an ongoing basis, which, is just, would, which would just be absurd. So it creates this zone of privacy in which the, the client with legal counsel, with consultants, with private investigators, with others, is able to pull together the information that they need in order to defend themselves in, in this litigation. And again, it, it only survives for so long as the litigation is real. Um, if, if, the, if the case is lost, if it concludes and there's no appeal, for example, then that information is no longer subject to litigation privilege. Now, if it was produced by a lawyer or if it's uh, a communication, so there could be an overlap in this Venn diagram. So it could be information that is simultaneously subject to litigation privilege and legal advice privilege, privilege because it was uh, created for the purpose of obtaining legal advice related to this litigation, then it's always going to be subject to that legal advisor privilege, that legal advice privilege, and, and not, not just the litigation privilege. So, but privilege is, is different than confidentiality. And I think privilege is more than confidentiality. And certainly com simple confidentiality is not privileged. And, and privilege is a word that uh, I think is, is overused in some instances by individuals who perhaps don't exactly know what it is, uh, what the, the exact definition of legal advice privilege. You, you, if you look at, probably if you were to do a sample in your inbox of, of 100 email signatures uh, that you see, uh, you might see a bunch of email signatures uh, that say this email is privileged. It's like, well, no, no, it's not. Uh, I, I'm a lawyer, I send emails all the time. Many of probably most of my emails are privileged because I use it mainly to provide legal advice to clients. Uh, but I'm a lawyer and I email my wife and say, I'm going to pick up milk on my way home from the office. Um, that's not privileged. That's not for the purpose of, of seeking legal advice. So you often see in email signatures, oh, this, this information is privileged. Well, no, just because you say it is doesn't do it. Um, and, and I'm sometimes concerned that if you say too many things are privileged, you undermine the value of that particular word. If you, if you over assert it, uh, I tend to think you should focus on uh, really what the, what the high risk stuff is. And so I will often, if it's a particularly sensitive matter, I will type at the top of my email, this is solicitor client privilege. This is legal advisor privilege. This is advice of, of legal counsel. Just to be just to be abundantly clear, because I think the the statements and email signatures are probably not worth the electrons uh, that they're that they're written on. And recognizing, so I talked about discovery obligations in connection with litigation. Anything that's relevant, regardless of whether it's confidential, has to be provided to the other side if it's not privileged. So privilege is the only basis upon which that you can withhold relevant confidential information. And so very often that information can be harmful to somebody's legal position. Uh, I don't think I have yet seen an organization that has brought in proactively uh, an information security professional to do a threat risk assessment, for example, or to do a, a penetration test or a vulnerability assessment or a gap analysis where they haven't found problems. You're gonna start flipping over rocks and you're gonna start finding bugs. Uh, and those reports can show uh, really things that reflect poorly on the organization. I think sometimes in, in connection with lawsuits, there's not enough of a recognition that you can never have perfect security and I'd never have a perfect system. If you identify 15 things that are wrong, the organization is likely to triage them and focus on the high priority five and the high risk five, leaving potentially 10 unaddressed or maybe even, even fewer than that. But you know, if there's a report that says, oh, the, we've identified these 15 risks and the organization doesn't address them all, and there is an incident involving one of those other risks, they're gonna look, certainly they're gonna look reckless. So I've, I've been in, involved in a, in a piece of litigation uh, that involved the federal government where after a number of, uh, of privacy and uh, information security incidents brought in a private consultant uh, to do an assessment 
of their compliance uh, with security and information security best practices. Uh, that consultant was not a lawyer. That consultant produced a report that essentially said, this office is a dumpster fire. Uh, you guys are really lucky that you don't have even more security incidents and privacy incidents. Uh, and you guys aren't doing enough to manage the risk that you have. And really with current practices, there's no way you're gonna get to an acceptable level of risk. Well, not surprisingly, a significant privacy incident came out of that organization. Um, that report is not privileged. That report was not produced by a lawyer to tell them what, whether they were complying with the Privacy mm -hmm. Act. That report was produced by a, a non-lawyer consultant. And so that is gonna be exhibit A, smoking gun, uh, that the organization knew or ought to have known that their situation was really bad. And they were, uh, they had a higher, uh, duty of so they had the same duty of care, but they were probably reckless because they actually did not live up to the standard of care. They knew that they were not living up to the standard of care and an incident happened. And certainly most organizations would really, really, really like in hindsight for a report like that not to become the smoking gun that's going to be used, used against them. So when it comes, particularly with respect to incident response, but also with respect to gap analysis and benchmarking against best practices, um, you should really encourage your clients to involve legal counsel as, as soon as possible. As soon as possible after an incident so that as much as possible can be protected by privilege or protectable by privilege. Not all organizations are gonna to want to do that necessarily, uh, but if you don't involve lawyers providing legal advice, um, the horse might be out of the barn and it might be too late to, to do that. Uh, you'll also wanna make sure that they contact their insurer notify their broker. Um, some, we're seeing more and more cyber insurance policies, and we're seeing a greater variety of cyber insurance policies. And we've also seen uh, a number of cases where employee mischief was involved. So it's not actually covered under the cyber policy, but it's covered under uh, a different policy related to employee misconduct. And so all of these insurance companies need to be notified as soon as possible. And so the organization really wants to notify their broker almost immediately and say, look, we have an incident. This is what we know so far. Um, and uh, please advise us whether we have coverage for it. Uh, and please start the process uh, to uh, be ready to initiate a claim. In some instances, the deductible is so high that, that it's not worth making a claim at that time. Um, but, uh, but they'll want to be thinking about that right out of the gate and make sure that they're not in a position where they realize, oh my goodness, we actually did have insurance and everything has been managed and the insurance company has said not, says not to our satisfaction, it was too late, uh, you gave us notice too late, so we're not going to cover it. The investigation as much as possible should be framed in terms of seeking legal advice regarding legal risk and legal compliance um, and to prepare for any subsequent litigation. Because uh, if it's not about getting legal advice, um, then it's not going to be subject to privilege. And so consultants can't provide privilege, but their work product can be privileged if it's prepared on behalf of the client so the client can obtain legal advice or to prepare for litigation. So for example, if uh, let's say in, uh, I wasn't involved in Life Labs, I don't have any behind the scenes information about Life Labs. Let's say Life Labs immediately contacted their outside lawyers and their outside lawyers said, look, we need to understand uh, what your obligations are, whether you've triggered your obligations to notify privacy commissioners and, and to, to report to privacy commissioners and to notify individuals. We need information in order to understand what your obligations are and what your legal risk is with respect to a, a possible investigation by those regulators, and we need to be prepared for that. And we need to be thinking and managing uh, legal risk in connection with litigation. And in order to get the information that's necessary for that lawyer to provide that advice to the client, specific expertise is required. So they contact Cytelligence, they contact others, they contact KPMG, and they say, look, the, as the lawyer, I need particular information so that I can provide advice to the client. And so I need you on behalf of the client to seek out that information. Uh, so in, in a sense, those consultants are acting like the client. Uh, so if the client had that sort of in-house expertise, those in-house experts, subject matter experts, would be getting the information, would be compiling, would be feeding it to the lawyers. They don't have that expertise in-house, so they hire it. And so those consultants, that their work product, if it's prepared so that the client can get legal advice, 
or if it's compiled so that they can prepare for litigation, those consultants reports should be subject to privilege. Um, I don't know whether that is in fact how it was structured in the Life Labs, uh, Life Labs case. Uh, seems likely that's, that's relatively common these days. Um, but it, again, it will be interesting to see what the, what the court ultimately says with that. And so there are no magic words. So just marking a document as privilege does nothing. And, and copying lawyers doesn't create privilege. And you know, a number of organizations, this gets a little bit more attention in the States. Big companies have been uh, kind of dragged through the mud for uh, just the, the, the practice of copying lawyers on emails, uh, imagining that is, if there's a lawyer on the email, all of a sudden that email is gonna be, is gonna be privileged. And no, that, that email has to, be, has to exist for the purpose of seeking or obtaining legal advice. It could be to compile background information that's gonna feed the, uh, feed the advice. Uh, but if it's just, hey, just for information, that's not good enough. Um, it gets even more complicated with in-house lawyers. So lawyers who work full-time for particular companies and are employees of that company. Very often, a part of their job is actually providing business advice. And so if, if the advice that, that is being sought from them and that they're providing is business advice and not legal advice, then that's not gonna be subject to privilege either. And so those in-house lawyers providing business advice uh, need to be very careful. And there's a, a reason why, and I think that's part of the reason why uh, in the event of a data breach, unless the insurance company brings in outside lawyers, often called a breach coach, uh, that organizations hire outside lawyers because it's apparent, you know, it's absolutely clear that the purpose of that outside lawyer is to provide legal advice. And so those communications are going to be subject to privilege. It just removes the blurriness of whether or not it's business advice or, or legal, legal advice. And so it's not just about playing well with others. So Thinking about this in terms of the background, um, I, I tend to think that you know, there are three overlapping interests at play, and this may not be the best diagram. I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer, not a graphic artist, um, but uh, there's the legal stuff, there's the information security stuff, and the business stuff. And you know, frankly, the business people are the ones who ultimately need to be the ones who are making the decision because their legal risk, what seems to be legal risk to me is ultimately their business risk. Um, and they need to be well informed about what that legal risk is so that they can make those business decisions. They need to understand what the situation is from an information security point of view in order to drive those business decisions. And so often different personalities and different concerns, different education backgrounds and different sorts of terminology. And so I tend to think, and, and one of the so I, I was attracted to this area of law. So I've been practicing exclusively in the area of, of privacy and, and technology law uh, for just over 20 years now. Um, and, you know, there was a, a point at which I had to make the decision, was I going to go into computer science or was I going to continue on the path to, on the path to law? Uh, I, can, I can code a bit. I'm super interested in what's going on under the hood. I probably I, I couldn't implement anything from a technical point of view other than at a relatively low level, I can secure my own home network. Um, but I'm very interested in and, and try to keep up to date on what's going on in on the technical side of things. And so being able to understand the people who speak the technical stuff uh, and being able to understand the people who speak the business stuff uh, and being able to communicate among those three different languages or th three different points of view or perspective, I, I think is, is a real asset. Uh, for me, at least. And I think the more people who are at that table who have those skills uh, are going to be extra valuable. Because this is everything it is, it's a multidisciplinary venture. And so being able to speak business, legal and tech, I think is a, is a huge skill. And so those and it's not just a skill for lawyers, I think it's a skill for the tech folks as well. Um, business folks, uh, sometimes you have people who have come up through the technical side of the business into management and, and have that native uh, awareness and native, native skill set. That's relatively rare. Um, but uh, depending upon, you know, if it's a technical business, very often the engineering folks uh, are, have been at the management table and there's already a, a better level of trilingualism within that table. But if we're going to join that table, um, being able to speak everybody else's language and being able to translate from one to the other uh, is, a, is a huge, so understanding it is a huge skill. I think being able to translate, so explain the business stuff and give instructions to somebody else, 
on, on, let's say on the technical side to meet that business objective. So being able to do that translation, I think is, is an even, even bigger skill. And then being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and understand exactly what their concern is and what they're looking for, what they're, what's keeping them up at night, what's their stressor. Like that's, that's an enormous skill to be able to, to do that. That's that level of empathy and understanding, which I think is a real value add at, at that table. So I tend to, I try to read as much technical and, and business uh, literature as I can in the area that, uh, that I'm dealing with on a regular basis so that I'm, I'm up to date on what's going on. Uh, but also I'm used to reading, reading the language, understanding the language, understanding the terminology, understanding what the, what the concerns are, getting different perspectives. And so I would strongly advocate for, for those who wanna grow in this business to read as much as you can about privacy and security that you can get, get your hands on. Try to dig deep into their perspectives, understand where they're coming from, um, and also try to use as best as you can plain language or plain language summaries in, in your reports. Um, you're, you're very often producing, uh, dealing with very technical issues, but if you can make it make sense to a, to a lay person, because what, one thing that's, that in many cases is going to have to happen is that that technical report is going to land in front of a lawyer who's going to start writing a letter to all the affected individuals if it was a privacy breach. And it's gonna be writing a letter to the privacy commissioner or privacy commissioners explaining what happened. Um, and, if, and if it can be made to make sense, if it starts out in that report with the plain language summary, that's a, that's, you're, that's a significant value add at that, particular, at that particular time. So if it's accurate and understandable, that's, that's even more valuable for that purpose than accurate and long and convoluted. So kind of the, the, the TLDR version for, uh, for lay people. It also makes sense to, to learn the language. Lawyers use a different language and the legal terms can, can vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So for example, personal information is the term that we use, um, not PII. Um, personal information is the legal term that exists within all privacy statutes in, in Canada or personal health information if it's a health statute. Um, and so when we're talking, when lawyers say, lawyers should know what they're doing, talk about personal information, they're talking about a specific legal definition, a legal concept of, of information. Um, we can obviously say, oh, well, also it's personal data, it's personally identifiable information, but you know, information that's not personally identifiable can still be personal information uh, if it's not identifiable from the data, but identifiable from triangulation of other, other data points. Um, so it's personal information if it's about an individual who can be identified from the data or there's a real risk of, of re-identification from, uh, from that data. Also, if it's, for example, it's fully encrypted, it may not be personal information anymore because the person who receives it in encrypted state and can't decrypt it is not able to identify anybody from, from what's going on. And also what law applies will likely correspond to, to where the, the individuals live. So there's some, some legal concepts related to privacy that, um, <clears throat> and, and some terminology that's used differently in the legal side than in the security side. And so understanding, oh, are we using this term in this sense? Or are we using this term in that sense? Or even better, can we stop using terms that could have two different meanings because we wanna make sure that we're understood. Um, I wanna make sure that I understand you and, and you hopefully wanna make sure that, uh, that I can understand what it is that, that you're telling me and that we're, and that we're all, on the, all on the same page. And lingo and, and terms of art are relatively, relatively important. Another thing you can do is, is be prepared. Get to know your client and their lawyers if you, if you can, if you have that, that opportunity. Uh, I think that a, a tabletop exercise in anticipation, in preparation for a breach, running through case studies and, and scenarios is an incredibly valuable thing that you can do. Because too often an incident happens, the team is assembled. Sometimes you've met other people on the team, sometimes not. Um, but there's a little, there's not very much opportunity to meet and greet and get to know people's personalities, get to know their work styles, get to know their expectations. Um, and so to the extent that you can actually uh, meet in advance, and frankly, uh, organizations of any level of complexity should already have a team on speed dial. Um, and that list of people to contact and their contact information should be on a piece of paper somewhere, not just on a server. Um, certainly I've, I've seen, uh, incidents responded to where the incident response plan is on a server that they don't have access to um, and uh, or that uh, they can't communicate with the other people on the team 
uh, because the only emails that they have are, or the contact information is saved in an email system that had to be, had to be taken offline. Um, sometimes the insurer will parachute in their preferred teams and they may not know the may not know the business. And so most large insurance companies have a group of information security professionals, forensic people, um, lawyers who they call breach coaches and others who, who they already know that they've negotiated uh, discounted rates with and they will bring them in. So there've been a number of times and I'm not offended by this insurance. If, if they're paying the bill, they get to choose. Where I have an existing client, they have an incident. I'm brought in, I'm called on one of the first calls. Uh, spend a day or two working with the client on the particular incident, the insurance company says, yes, we, this is insured, we're going to respond to it. And, and so we're bringing in our, our folks, they'll pay my bill up to that point, but they, they have their preferred folks who come in after that. And so tabletop exercises can be invaluable uh, in order to understand who's going to call the shots, who's responsible for what, also what the processes are. Um, that, uh, for example, I recently did one with a post-secondary institution, and ultimately, it was going to be the president who was going to make the shot, who was going to make all the decisions ultimately, uh, but the president would not be at that table. And so understanding what the tempo of and the communications to the ultimate decision maker was going to be was very eye opening and to understand, okay, well, if an incident happens, this is what we can expect. These are the people who are going to be around the table, and, and we understand what it is they're, what they're looking for. So get to know who does what, who calls the shots, who's the decision maker, who's an influencer. Uh, who has who is going to need handholding? Who who has strong skills? The more you can do that, the greater value that you're going to be in 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 connection with that uh, with that engagement. So I think we've left about uh, I think uh, seven minutes uh, for for questions. Um, I'm happy to. Uh, I think we have a small enough group that uh, if, if anybody wants to turn on the well, I guess you don't have to turn on your camera, but if you want to unmute yourself and uh, and. Uh, Provide it uh, that way, or you can, I guess, drop it in the drop it in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm I'm all ears. Thank you, David. I know I have a question, but before I do, does anyone else wants to go first? I was just going to say thank you. It was good. I enjoyed the the privilege uh, part there. That was that was even though I've seen it for many years, it's always good to get it clarified. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it can be complicated and, and you, you can end up with some interesting sort of fringe edge cases. And, uh, and I deal with this regularly, but I, there's an old, <laughs> old gray haired lawyer who in, in my office is like the expert on this and, and he's my speed dial on. We have this interesting kind of privilege question. And, uh, and so understanding its parameters and really what it boils down to was the communication done for the purpose of obtaining legal advice from a lawyer, because it doesn't have to be a communication between a lawyer and somebody else because it could be somebody getting information from somebody else in the company so that it can then be given to the lawyer to get legal advice and so understanding where all those different steps are and, and who's doing what and why and just slapping privileged or, or confidential on something doesn't uh, doesn't automatically make it uh, make it so so glad that was helpful thank you Alan. uh i it's more less than a question and more of Kind of a scenario that I me personally faced a lot during my law enforcement years, and I was kind of curious of hearing your opinion okay, on the following scenario. So, we had a lot of instances when we would be doing our search and seize operations in the field, and once the client, you know, the target the client, would engage a lawyer we would get something we would call, them. they would call a blanket privilege claim, meaning that the lawyer would be falsely engaged during our contact with our target. They were never in contact before. And we would get claims like everything is privileged, all the technology is privileged. You are not to touch anything without providing the necessary grounds to why it's privileged or maybe filtering some of that. So those blanket privileges would be announced and accepted and followed through upon. And I was just kind of wondering what your opinion of, I would call it maybe even abusing the privilege by specific lawyers. I mean, how does that look in your eyes? Yeah, certainly that uh, I can understand on one hand, the impulse of a lawyer to claim privilege over anything that could be privileged. Because you know, once, if, if something is, you know, you can, 
it's less likely now that you would accidentally waive privilege. The client has to actually make a decision to waive privilege. And so if, if I were to inadvertently send something that was privileged inadvertently to an investigator, for example, to, to following your scenario, it wouldn't lose its, its privileged nature as a result. Uh, I would have to tell you, oh, I inadvertently sent you something that was that was privileged, or you had access to something that was privileged. You can't you can't use it, but nobody can really unknow some information. And so, I understand the impulse to say, hey, look, this this could be privileged, and therefore we're going to claim it. But it, it's a little bit like the boy who cried wolf. If you overclaim privilege, um, and so you end up with. And I, I, judges aren't happy with this at all because the the only person who can determine whether something is in fact actually privileged is, is going to be a court. It's going to be a judge, and judges don't like having to make that call. And so if somebody says, "Oh, you can't have it; it's privileged," and you have a production order saying it has to be produced, what do you end up doing? You end up going into court, and the, the judge is probably going to have to review the material to determine whether or not it's privileged and they don't want to do that <laughs> they're not going to be happy if they're asked to, if they're asked to do that and so if, if it was claimed when it shouldn't have been the judge is not going to be happy with that particular lawyer for for having for having done so um and so i, I do think that uh, there is a risk and and i think probably driven in part by technology so if i'm communicating with a client uh and that client is the target of an investigation and as often happens, their, their phone is seized and it's imaged. Well, that phone is going to contain some of their correspondence with me, probably by email. And so there's going to be a little sliver of data on that device that's going to be privileged. Everything else is not privileged, but that device does contain some privileged information. And there are procedures in order to segregate that information, in order to bring in what's often called a referee or a third party. Uh, so the, the the police don't image the device. Somebody else is brought in to image the device, take out the privileged stuff, hand over the rest of it, and 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 to to protect the chain of custody, but remove remove. The, so all that becomes cumbersome. And I think that's just part of the way that technology works these days. If you if anybody's interacting with a lawyer and you image their their phone, their their computer, their email account, there's going to be stuff in there that's privileged, um, and it's possible to say, oh well you can't touch this computer because it contains privileged stuff. It's like, no, no, you need to handle it carefully. Um, but that's not, that's not the full answer. But uh, certainly, you know, it's not unknown for lawyers to overassert all sorts of things, including privilege, I guess. So. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that was kind of what was happening in our cases. And we would be looking at it as a way to drag out the case. And yes, it was one very specific lawyer that <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. it happens. Thank you. Thank you, David. Any any more questions from anyone on the call? Okay, so we have a few comments in the chat. And those are I think yeah. people are commenting from the chat. Okay, in that case, I guess we are done. Thank you so much, David. I know I learned from the presentation, and I'm sure the other members of our chapter around as well. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And, and I, I hope it was valuable. And uh, I'll email you uh, uh, the version of this presentation that I gave at, at, the, uh, at the annual conference is, is on my website at blog.privacylawyer.ca. Uh, but I'll also email you a copy if you want to email around to any of the participants. And of course, uh, it's recorded and, and anybody who, uh, who, uh, who miss out can, uh, uh, can watch that. But it, anybody can feel free to, to reach out to me. My contact information is there. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to happy to chat about any aspect of this. If you're on the drive home, you think, ah, oh, I had a question or, or a question comes to you, just uh, feel free to reach out. Always happy to chat. That's amazing. Thank you so much, David. Okay. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.